You're listening to Field Day with Katie Black. All righty. Um, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Field Day with Katie Black. I'm honored today I have with me... Marcus Ogden, a national national keynote speaker, executive coach, and podcast host. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Katie. I appreciate it. So first off, where were you born slash where did you grow up? I was born and I grew up in Washington, D.C. And what was that? What was that experience like? Did you love it? Was it? Oh, I, I loved it. I grew up in Washington, D.C. Grew up in Washington, D.C. It was awesome. Uh, you know, my dad raised us as a single father. I was very close to my maternal grandparents, probably about 20 minutes away. So D.C. was absolutely amazing for me. I had a great experience in Washington. Very cool. And so progressing, I understand that you went to Howard. Correct. Very much so. And so you played football there as well. That's correct. And so what was Howard like? What was being an athlete at Howard like? Okay. Being an athlete at Howard was phenomenal because my dad played at Howard University as well. So he was there from 1969 to 1972 track and football i went there from 1998 to 2002 he was inducted to howard's athletic hall of fame in october of 2018 and then i was inducted to their athletic hall of fame october of this year so we're the first and only father and son duo to be in howard's athletic hall of fame which was an amazing experience to have that happen and to have me inducted this past october that's amazing congrats Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, obviously my show is focused on athletes of all types. Was curious, at what point did you start playing football? And then off on that, what part were you like, I'm really good at this? So I started playing football as a freshman in high school. I realized I was really good at the game going into my last year at Howard University when I was in people's draft books and potential draft boards, and I talked to my brother who was already an NFL athlete playing for the mm -hmm. Baltimore Ravens, said, Marcus, yes, people are saying you have a chance to be drafted. You have to work hard, have a great last year, try hard to get through a bowl game, go to the bowl game, showcase yourself against other guys from bigger schools like, you know, Miami, Texas, Florida State, Florida. Because at that time, that's where the powerhouses were, Miami, Texas, uh, who else was a powerhouse? Florida State, uh, Florida, they were powerhouses. It wasn't Alabama or, you know, Georgia. Like, they were good, but they weren't the powerhouse like they are today. So, for me, it was getting into a bowl game, which I did. I went to the Hula Bowl, had a great showing against some top talent from Notre Dame and other big schools, and I got drafted in 2003 by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Wow. So what is what is the vibe? What is the energy? What is the experience of getting drafted like? Oh, it's amazing, Katie. Like when you see your name come across that screen and all the hard work that you put into your craft, all the countless hours in the gym, all the countless hours on the field, all the countless hours preparing for the draft, going to different you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, trips, different teams, being interviewed and getting to meet people and going through all the process and the questions and the testing, mental, physical, you know, all that type of stuff, your ability to constantly think and network with people and mesh with people and to be drafted, it was to say, wow, all your hard work actually did pay off. Because, I mean, obviously, it becomes, like, your, part of your soul, right? That Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, anything that you do as a person, if you're giving your all, your heart and soul should be into it. Otherwise, why even bother doing it? Like, you have this podcast. I'm sure your heart and soul goes into it. We have a podcast. You know, our heart and soul goes into it. You don't have your heart and soul into something, then why the hell are you doing it? So, absolutely, when, you, when I was drafted, it was like, wow. I can actually pour into this game now at the highest level possible. When I thought, Katie, after my high school last football game, my football career was going to be over because I didn't get an offer from Howard until like a week before the, before signing day. Oh, my goodness. Now, as far as, um, and I've asked a few athletes this, as far as like diet, is that something that someone at some point, whether college or NFL, 
like has some kind of conversation with you guys or is that just not a focus no it was not a focus for me in college or the nfl because as an offensive lineman i was taught to be big now today they do a great job of getting big getting lean eating better and all that and it's not to say they didn't do a good job, but as a lineman, I wasn't really focused on that because I was having a hard time keeping weight on, trying to get drafted. So I would eat like ten to 12,000 calories a day oh just God. to stay and maintain like that 300-pound weight limit because I didn't want to be less than that because I didn't want to have people say, well, is he too small for the NFL? Is he too light for the NFL? And as I got into the NFL, I got bigger and bigger than my heaviest I was 375 pounds when I played uh, in the NFL at my absolute heaviest. Now, are you, I know this is random, but obviously you can tell I'm kind of slightly random. Are you a Gatorade guy? Or just water? Or? I, I drink this now. I drink a lot of water. I mean, when I was in the NFL, I was doing a lot of Gatorade, Powerade. But now uh, I know the effects of uh, water. Now, of course, I have a Gatorade or uh, something like that every once in a while or an energy drink, right? But like my primary drink today is, is water. I feel that. Okay, so going back to your um, the NFL, what was I know that you were on several teams. Was there? I know this might be unfair, but was there a favorite one or a team that you help hold you know close to your heart? Good question. The Baltimore Rays was my favorite because I got to play with my brother and amazing players like Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, Terrell Suggs, and the Baltimore fan base was so amazing when i retired from the nfl i moved back to baltimore and i started a construction company and that's where we kind of got started you know in that you know in that degree very cool any like outstanding moments from any of the games that you played yeah i remember playing the minnesota vikings in their old stadium i was a rookie and i remember the guy in the motorcycle coming out with his axe and like acting all crazy, you know, 80,000 plus fans screaming. It was my first NFL game. And then the guy who had the axe, like their, their mascot, pointed his axe at me, went like this, like, you know, you're done, you're gone. And I was like, wow. Like, and I could like, did you just point <laughs> me out on all my teammates? You found me? Really? That's, that's some craziness. And it made me realize right there, Katie, this is no longer college this is the national football league the best of the best and if you don't bring your best you're not going to stay long yeah i'm just just letting that marinate and also obviously you mentioned you have you know both you and your brother played what's that energy like what is that it's it's it, it's like your hero is leading you and guiding you while you play because i was an old lineman so was he uh -huh. He taught me so much about the game, uh, fundamentals, you know, schematics, mentality, how to do your best and how to be your best. And because of my brother and his teaching and my and it helping me to become a better player than I was, it allowed me to have a longer career because I knew the game better, I knew position better, and I knew how to make things work better with my body for my size and what I had. And that made me a much better player and athlete overall. Very cool. What is, what is it like to be in a line of work where everyone is looking at you? It's awesome, but it's also stressful. It's mm -hmm. also very arduous because you don't have room for error. You have nowhere to hide. Like mm -hmm. in a corporate America job, you're in a cubicle. If you want to hide from everybody, you can go to your office, you can close your door, you can hide in your cubicle. Nobody knows where, you're, where you are, what you're doing. You can hide. In the NFL, you can't hide. So it's very stressful because you have to operate at your best every single play. And if you don't, you get beat, which happens. You have to put it out of your mind and go to the next play. And that's where a lot of athletes struggle. It's not the physical part of the game. It's the mental part of the game where they struggle. That's very interesting. How did you, did you learn along the way? Or, you know, I study regardless of sports, but I've always studied, you know, fame, which is a category, what have you. Um, How did you deal with being in the limelight and maybe kind of taking note of who's around you, good or bad? Great question, but I, because I had my brother who was in for seven years before me, I got a chance to be around him and learn from him. So fame didn't go to my head because seeing my brother and how he operated and how he carried himself, I knew 
if I have a, a big head, he was going to tell me. So was my father. And I was always about just being very humble and grateful that I was in the NFL and just working as long and as hard as I could to stay in the NFL. And I had almost a six year career because of that. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. So what was, you know, which is a, a whole conversation in itself. What was it like, you know, emotionally um, once football, the football chapter closed? Oh, it was hell on earth. Like, what do I do next? Where am I going to go? How am I going to spend my time? You know, I believe a lot of athletes struggle in keeping their money because they have a lot of cash and a lot of idle time on their hands. And if you don't have a good structure, a good time management regimen, I feel you're going to end up making mistakes and spending a lot of money, getting in bad positions. That's exactly what happened to me. Now, luckily, after six months of alcoholism, pain popping, you know, addict, you know, gambling addict, nightlife, women addict. I got myself together and found a construction company. But for six months, Katie, it was hell on earth because I didn't know what to do next. And I had no proper plan of how to execute the next phase of my life. And is that just, and this is kind of like what I've studied and I'm learning as I go, obviously talking to you guys, is that, do you feel like they're a huge chunk of that is because there is no preparation, like the NFL, not just to, you know, call out the NFL specifically, but there is no program. There is no, hey, guys, X, Y, Z might happen once it ends. It's just kind of like you're let go. You know what I mean? So when I was playing, there wasn't anything. But in 2013, through the new CBA, they formed like the NFL Trust, the NFL Player Care Foundation, NFL Former Players Alliance. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the NFL legend. So now guys have access to transitional things after football, money management, uh, you know, health and wellness, relationship advice, all that stuff. So that is in the works now. And as a matter of fact, the NFL Player Care Foundation saved my life in 2013 when I lost everything in my construction company, moved to Raleigh. I was almost homeless the NFL Player Care Foundation paid four months of my bills to my creditors, including my rent to my landlord, so I wouldn't go homeless. Because when I moved here after my losing everything in my business, I only had four hundred dollars to my name. That's it. So, like the Gridiron Greats, you know, Mike Dickus Foundation. There's so many foundations now to help former players, but the former player has to make the first step, saying, "Hey, I need help." and when I did that, the NFL stepped up without hesitation and helped me in my time of need. Wow, that's a lot to unpack. I mean, amazing that like you had, you know, you had people to help you out. Um, how long do you think like once football ended till you said that like you were almost homeless? Like how much time was that? So I... 2008, I retired. It was five years. I ended up almost going homeless after I lost my construction company in 2013. So it wasn't from spending money idly. It was from making bad business decisions and then having a huge ego because I had a lot of success in our construction company. We were the largest African-American owned subcontracting business in the city of Baltimore state of Maryland for two years. And because of my success and my ego getting the best of me, I ended up losing everything the next year because I made a big mistake on one job and then I lost all of my best employees through lack of money and then a huge toxic ego. And that caused everybody to kind of move on. And I was stuck you know, with nothing. And I lost everything, home, cars, credit, money, everything in 2013. Wow. Well, it sounds like you've done like a lot of like self-reflection, self-analyzation. Yes, now I have. Yes, in my work as a speaker, coach, consultant, brand ambassador, owner of different businesses, uh, very successful podcasts ourselves, I've learned to self-reflect and look at what I've done in the past and how I could be better today and into the future. Well, props to you because, I mean, there's a lot of people that don't, don't do that regardless of the circumstances so very true and i ask this too just because i study all the things in the world and i i don't drink but like do you consider yourself sober you know there's different 
there's a scale of sober. You know, you hear California sober, you hear old school sober, or you just any any thoughts so on I'm, that? So I'm so I mean I'm sober. I'll have social drinks like if I'm out somewhere, but I don't drink alone anymore like I used to. So to me, my alcoholism was at its worst when I would come home. You know, after losing everything, I would pop over like, you know, a 12 pack of middle light drink, almost a whole can sitting there in my little room, like with my TV on, watching old movies and feeling sorry for myself or watching my old high school football taste for what I used to be and all that. So today I don't do that anymore. If I, if I, if I'm out, I have a social drink. I know my limits, but if I'm home, whatever, I don't drink alone by myself anymore because to me, that triggers the memories of what I used to do when I was really at my worst. Well, I understand. I understand. You are into involved in so many different things. You said you have a podcast. I know um, you coach. You're also an author. How did all, what happened first? Or did they all kind of happen at once? Great question. So what happened first was after my rock bottom moment of clarity, and I love the quote by J.K. Rollins, uh, rock bottom is where I rebuilt my life. I started speaking first. Speaking went struggle for a while. Finally got better at that, got good at that. Then after speaking, came along coaching. Let me go back. I'm sorry. I started speaking in 2013, got no page off in two and a half years. Then I wrote our first book, got published in 2015. And speaking picked up more and more. Then I got into coaching. Then I got into consulting. Then we wrote our second book, became another bestseller, The Success Cycle. Then we got into being a brand ambassador for different organizations that would take equity, different things, all that. Then we worked on a third book, which became a bestseller again. I was a co, I was a contributing author in another book. Then we launched our podcast, The Get Authentic with Marcus Ogden Show. And then we ended up, you know, doing everything else as far as, you know, more brand ambassador work and other ownership of businesses. So speaking, then becoming an author, then coaching, then consulting, and then being a brand ambassador, owner of different businesses, and then getting into the podcast. Awesome. Like I said, props. I know I said that a few times, but props to you. Thank um, you. Yes, yes, and I mean it. A couple more um, questions here towards the end. Um, any lasting effects from the game that you care to share? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I had the white dots forming in my head from the hits and the collisions and all that, which won't go away. It's not getting any worse, thank God, but it's there. Uh, that's the price that I paid for the game because I was an o line. It was like a car crash, high school, college, and NFL. And when we played, the game was different. You could have double pads every day. There was no limit to how many days you could have shoulder pads on and helmets and full contact tackling and all of that. So the way we played the game was much, much different than it is today. And so, yeah, I've got some damage. I mean, I've got some knee problems. I've got some, you know, some back problems. I've got the white dots forming from when I took my uh, brain and body assessment. And, but, you know, that's the price that you paid. You know, and that's the trade off. And so I'm not ashamed of it, but, you know, it's what it is in football. Did a lot of damage to my body. But at the same time, it's allowed us a platform to move to what we're doing now, be able to have a, another chance to do something greater than football with what we're doing after the game. Very cool. Yeah, and I, and I understand that because, you know, I guess, you know, with everything I try to ask, no matter who I'm speaking with, it's like, would you, after what you know now, would you still go for, like, you know, no regrets essentially. And so you have, do you have no regrets about going down the path oh, of football? No. No, absolutely not. No. Any advice you give, you know, athletes of today playing the game? You know, what I tell athletes is in times of extreme darkness, focus on the light, quote by Aristotle. When you're having hard times or things aren't going your way, focus on yourself and how you can fix the problem. Don't look outside yourself. Look internally not external. I feel if you can look at that and you can judge yourself and position yourself off that, then great things perhaps will happen for you. Yes, yes. Now, at the end, I like to go off the beaten path and I am obsessed with the unexplained. Um, I don't know, did you ever used to watch Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack? Yep. Back in the day? <laughs> 
Um, so my favorite segment was the unexplained segment of that, meaning ghost, the, you know, unexplained, any kind of way you want to twist it. But was wondering if you've ever seen a ghost or something spiritual or cool that you can share. I remember I had a dream probably, I don't know, many years ago, probably, ugh, I don't know, maybe, shoot. 12, 13 years ago, after my father passed away, I remember having a dream where I saw my dad and my uncle. I was talk I was in my back of my car talking to them, and the next thing I turn around and they're gone. And I can see my father's feet going up an escalator towards the clouds. And that's the last thing I saw of my dad. And I haven't had any real dreams about just him or anything like that since then. So I think that was my soul telling me to let go and not torture yourself or beat yourself up what happened to your dad when he passed away at 57 years old and i remember that dream vividly like i saw him we were talking to my uncle and then i turn around they were gone and i just saw my dad's feet with his little flip-flops so he's always used to wear nike flip-flop broken down flip-flops going up the escalator towards the clouds and that's the last time i saw him. that's very cool i mean i did that bring you peace it did it did and it was hard still because that was like the last goodbye. But yeah, it brought me peace at the same time. Yes. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Of course. I'm very authentic. That's the name of our podcast. Get authentic with Marcus Ogden. I'm not going to be real talking to people. Then just don't even bother having a conversation. <laughs> right. Right. Any, um, anything you've learned or in the podcasting game? Or anything you take away? Or what do you think about? Because I always ask so, that. It just, you know, it's, just, learned, it's kind of the wild, wild west right now with the podcasting. I've learned. So our show has been out for five months tomorrow. We're in the top one and a half percent globally most listened to podcast. We got that in two and a half months. And I'll tell you this. The diversity of your guests plays a major role in the success or failure of your podcast. Plain and simple. If you're trying to capture space in the marketplace, you better have some super diverse guests from all different backgrounds. Otherwise, you're going to be competing against other podcasts that are niche, that already have a following, already have a build up, and you're going to, if ever, take you a long time to break into listeners, you know, their, their archives and to, to subscribe to your show and listen to your content because... They're like, well, you're niche. And so I already had this niche podcast that I like. Well, I'm going to pick up yours. So I always tell people diversity with your guests is going to bring you diversity and, and growth and expansion with your audience base. That's good advice for sure. Okay. Well, can you tell where people can find your website, find where they can listen to your podcast, any kind of shout outs you want to give? Sure. We can go to our website, www.marcusmar.com. Q-U-E-S, Ogden, O-G-D-E-N.com. Go to our podcast, the Get Authentic with Marcus Ogden show on Apple, Spotify, Google, iHeart, Stitcher, Pandora, Amazon. You can find us on our website. And yeah, shoot me an email, Marcus at MarcusOgden.com. If you want to connect with us, we'd love to chat with you. Yay. Well, that's it, Marcus. That's it. What'd you think? That was fantastic. I really appreciate you having me on, Katie. Yes, thank you so much for joining me and sitting down and sharing your experiences. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, before I let you go, though, um, so I am careful with saying clairvoyant, but like intuitive. So when I do these interviews or they don't have to be interviews, I can be just interacting with someone and I'll get like images. So I want to see if like you connect to this image or if I'm totally off kilter. <laughs> But um, so I, in the last 10 months I've been talking to you, I see like a mason jar with like homemade jelly. Is there any kind of connection to that? Yeah. I mean, there's a connection with, you know, as a custodian, I would clean up people's trash. I remember all kinds of trash, jelly bottles and, you know, and garbage and everything else. So that was my spoiled milk. When somebody's trash got on me and made me realize if I won't be accountable for my life, I'm going to be here all the time right here. So that ties into like part of that trash that made me realize I'm going to get off my ass today and be accountable or sit for the rest of my life blaming everybody else for my failures. Wow. 
Wow. Well, yeah, I, it connected. Sometimes I say things to people and they're like, I don't, not sure what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, that connected me quite well, actually. Okay, awesome sauce. Um, well, like I said, I sound like a broken record, but thank you so much for joining me and I hope to connect with you in the future. Sounds good. Look forward to seeing this when it comes out and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.